And now back to Public Television's presentation of the Podcasty Awards. Podcasting is not just the future. It helps us celebrate the past in the present. The next four storytellers have created audio adventures that remind us how amazing some of our TV heroes are. And the nominees for Best Television Icon Podcast are The Gaines Group, What's So Funky About Punky Brewster? Mr. Mr. Productions, I pity the fool who listens to this Mr. T podcast. Michael Arthur and Long, The Hoff Tells All, The Glory Days of a Night Rider. Lonely Weekend Productions, The Joy of Bob Ross, A Happy Little Podcast. And the winner is... The Joy of Bob Ross, A Happy Little Podcast, Lonely Weekend Productions. Wow, wow, man. For... First of all, what an honor to be in the same company as these inspiring and incredible nominees. I mean, David Hasselhoff, you're a legend. I want to thank Andrew and Josh. We did it, guys. Jesse Jansen, Jeff Langkow. Man, I, don't, I didn't think we were going to win tonight. I didn't prepare anything. Uh, Mom, Dad, thank you. Uh, Bob, oh yeah, how can I forget? Bob. Have you ever given a speech? Addressed an audience? Or maybe you've been shouted out in someone else's speech. A coworker, a friend, or a relative gives you praise for being part of their success. There's a lot of very special people that have worked very hard to make this come together and to bring you these shows. Walt and Annette, my partners, they're always there and they always are very supportive and I appreciate all of their efforts. And I'd like to publicly say thank you to both of them very special to me and my wife Jane she hangs in there it's hard to live with a crazy old painter I'll tell you that all right these people are very special to me maybe someone thanks you for being a mentor an inspiration and before I go far into the show I'd like to take a few minutes and make a dedication I would like to dedicate this show to my beloved friend and teacher whom we've all watched and loved for many years on public television, Bill Alexander. And years ago, Bill taught me this fantastic technique, and I feel as though he gave me a precious gift, and I'd like to share that gift with you. We see these moments all the time, in theaters, and stadiums, and ballrooms. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we see them in real time, at school, or at our jobs. We see people we actually know get their flowers, people just like us, sharing the credit, the spotlight, a lot of these moments bring tears, not just to folks on the giving and receiving ends of these speeches, but to all of us who witnessed the exchange. In spite of myself, I would not be alive without Pauletta Washington. I wouldn't be alive. <laughs> Lastly, and certainly not least, to my mother, Sissy Houston. Mommy, you're one of the greatest singers I know. I am so happy to see Steven Spielberg here tonight. Steven, thank you! She could have stopped me a long, long time ago, but she didn't. She kept me going and allowed me to play, so it's amazing. Thank you. Before this night, I don't think I'd ever heard anyone mention Bob Ross in a speech. But tonight, it's different. Tonight, everyone's here to talk about Bob Ross. In the last couple of weeks, months, I suddenly became a Bob Ross fan. So I am new to Bob Ross, even though I'm really old. I'm 72 years old. So um, I'm just discovering Bob Ross. The way he related that anybody could paint. I mean, I've never painted before, and I, I think I could paint with Bob, you know? The Joy of Painting was filmed on the campus of Ball State University. At least a good amount of it was. We'll head to the other spot where it was filmed in a minute. Tonight, 
I'm here at the Ball Communication Building, where the school is celebrating Bob. There's fancy cheese, so you know it's a legit party. I can never tell the difference between Comte and aged Gouda. You have to make a decision whether you want to be a traditional artist or an artist that eats regular. I'm an artist who likes to eat, but I was brought here to talk to folks, so the aged Gouda is going to have to wait. Here at the home of Ball State PBS, Bob's paintings are on display. His easel is here. Ginormous plaster squirrels adorn the hallways. And Master of Ceremonies and Assistant Dean of Media, Dr. Phil Hoffman, is giving the first of a few speeches about Bob. And during his speech, Dr. Phil gives a very special shout out. I really want to say a big thank you. Also tonight, we're joined by the man who had the idea and the conversation with Bob, Jim Needham. Jim, thank you, where's Jim? The man that made it happen. Jim. Television history, my friends. I'd never met Jim Needham before tonight. When the doc shouts him out, there he is, standing right next to me. Is that him? With the sombrero on? Hmm, it's more like a Panama hat. And Jim wears it well. Everyone turns towards Panama Jim, a tall, white-haired gentleman in glasses and that classic, cool, incredibly comfortable hat. Just to put a little hat up here on that. Gotta have him a little hat. Jim Needham has been recognized. He smiles and nods towards the podium. Turns out most everyone at this fiesta knows Jim. But to me, he's still a stranger. And here he is, just a few feet away, being shouted out in a speech about Bob Ross. So why is Jim Needham here? What was that conversation Jim and Bob had that led to television history? How did Jim Needham wind up being the man who made it happen? I'm going to grab some cheese and some of those little hors d'oeuvres. Then I'll tell you all about it. He's a hungry little dude. You getting excited, Jim? It's the joy of Bob. It's the joy of Bob Ross Podcast. Happy little stories about Bob. Let's really have some fun. Come on, let's talk Bob. Let's get crazy. On the joy of Bob Ross podcast, finding out why Bob so great's my job. Let's have a happy little tree right in here. He was a happy painter. His art inspired us all. We're gonna climb atop majestic mountains to swim under wonderful waterfalls. The joy. On Halloween 1971, public television station WIPB made its first ever broadcast. So Eastern Indiana Community Television is born, WIPB is born, and we span a full spectrum of a 40, 50 mile radius. Four years later, WIPB got a new general manager. On his first day on the job, Jim Needham stepped through the door of the L.L. Ball home, a little house nestled on a 40 acre lot in Muncie, Indiana. I came from Channel 8, the CBS station in Indianapolis, which had 200 people on our staff, and we had 10 here. And when I walked in, I looked around and realized it was this old house, and it was a quaint house, a beautiful house, but small compared to what I'd been in. Well, well you look around and see what kind of house you want, and you put him in there. And I was thinking to myself, where are all the people? How do we make the station run with 10 people? see Sesame Street on television. That's your business, Bert. Oh, what do we do now? I didn't know what was possible here, but I was excited about being in charge and, and having the opportunity to work in this community and live in this community. It was energizing and daunting, too, in some ways, to be charged with the responsibility of making sure the programs got on and that we produced programs. And to make it a community station, that's what they'd ask me to do. Serving the Muncie community was the mission. What to serve them was up to Jim. We've got 6,000 hours of broadcasting to put on each year. How do we do that here? I had so much to learn and I realized that. I was humbled by what I was experiencing. Humble Jim sorted it out and at a facility that bore little resemblance to a real TV studio. Now here are some views of things to come, right here 
on your new channel, 49. Jim proved he was good at doing a lot with a little. Next on Nova. As I was running down the beach, I noticed material glinting between high and, and low water in the early morning sun. I realized that I was running in human excrement, that the beach from high to low water for miles down there were covered with raw sewage. WIPB was running like a well-oiled machine in those next few years, with Jim Needham at the helm. But something was still missing from this house. Hmm, what was missing? Are you swimming in a sewer? That's next time on Nova. No, not that. Hello, I'm Bob Ross. There we go. A bushy-haired man in jeans and a chambray shirt and his female business partner had discovered WIPB while at art workshops at the nearby Delaware County Fairgrounds. And on one fateful day in 1983, they showed up at Jim Needham's door. He came to this place and popped a question he thought was a legitimate question. Are you interested? Have you ever thought of doing a painting show? Another thing the television series has done, it's allowed me to introduce a lot of new products and a lot of new ideas that I've never had the opportunity to, to share with you. And I said, no, we haven't, but we do all kinds of other programming that we enjoy doing and that the audiences uh, really like. What Jim and the WIPB audience didn't know was that their public television station was about to get a lot more likable. Let's get crazy. This is our world, so we can do anything. Maybe there's a little bush that lives right here. We'll just go back to a little oval brush. Just tap in the indication of maybe one little happy bush that lives over right there. There. Shoot, we got it made. Immediately, he was genuine. He was also very focused. He had good manners. He looked at you when he talked to you. He looked you in the eye. Everybody sees nature through different eyes, and painting is a way of putting your expression on canvas. So enjoy it. We just kind of went through one, two, three as he asked questions and I answered them directly. And I think that probably impressed him that I knew what I was talking about and I wasn't afraid and I was eager to, to explore his questions and his interests and Annette's. They both did the talking actually. It wasn't just Bob, it was Bob and Annette talking about what's possible and what we, they hoped to, they would find here. And this is just one of many ways of making clouds. We just try to show you as many ways as possible, and then you try it, and you pick the way of making each one of these little things that you like. Because some people will find that this way works great for them, other people will find that some other way of making clouds works even better. The first problem was how do I accommodate all of the, for them, how do we accommodate all the people we've attracted to these workshops that we don't have room for? We kind of shrugged our shoulders like I'm doing now and said, we, we can work that out. And as we came into to, to challenges, we would say the same thing. We can work this out. We had a can-do attitude. I encouraged that in my staff. I wanted people whose attitude was, we can do this. We'll find out. How, if we don't know how to do it, we'll figure it out, and we'll do it. And we did. I went to lunch with them shortly after they came in and sat there and talked for a couple hours. And I don't remember what we had. I remember the interchange where he said he was going to buy me lunch. And I refused and told him I had an expense account and he didn't. And, <laughs> and he didn't argue about that. But anyway, he just said, someday I'm going to buy your lunch and dinner whenever we eat and you will never pay for it again. And I looked at his car, which was an older car and it was a Datsun pickup camper. And I said uh, to myself, that'll be the day. <laughs> but it came about a year later and he, when he came back to do the second series and uh, he was already beginning to take control and, and really agency of, for his life and his and uh, and his program in a greater way than he had been before because you know he was working day to day before and all of a sudden things were starting to come together for him and it was exciting to see that Jim wasn't in this for the free meals but his decision to put Bob Ross on TV was about to pay dividends he was an authentic person he was somebody that you didn't question whether he was telling you the truth. He's a truth teller, he always was, and that was too. You can kind of hear that. It's not a you know, a recitation of an automatic. He was just being authentic and asking questions. And as his curiosity drove him, he would go down those paths. And I think today we'll do a picture that's maybe like we're walking through the woods. Bob Ross had big ideas. 
he and Annette were ready to take things up a notch. Was Jim the man who could help bring those ideas to life? It's all about making promises and keeping them. And if you don't do that, you're out of business. Jim Needham wasn't some stuffed shirt. Remember that shout out Jim got earlier? Jim Needham. Jim, thank you. Where's Jim? <laughs> the man that made it happen. Jim. Jim Needham's the real deal. Not the type to just give orders and watch others do the work. Jim led by example. He was an explorer too, often rolling up his sleeves out in the field, attaching cameras to motorcycles, leaning out of helicopters with a camera on his shoulder to capture footage. You guys ought to do a story about me sometime. Why should we do a story about you? What was it about you? What was it about WIPB that you think attracted Bob not just to start here, but to continue on the legacy through basically the end of the joy of painting, through at the end of his life, technically. I saw Annette and Bob as an opportunity to make some money for the station, to do something we could do and do well. I was sure of that because we'd been doing programs at that point for four or five years. The confidence that we had made it possible for us to relate to Bob, to embrace whatever we encountered, as a producer, you have to do that. You walk into situations where you don't know what's going to happen. The only reason we stay on television is because you, you allow it. He was another authentic individual who had a, 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 a desire and a focus. And he wasn't playing around. He was looking for answers to, to really important questions. And that always uh, encouraged me. So uh, I think we hit it off pretty much from the start. There's a lot of people here in the studio that work very hard to bring you, bring you a nice production. They really do a good job. A shared desire, a shared focus, the hallmarks of a successful team. Part of a team. Teamwork. Bob Ross was already a gangster when he walked through the front door of the L.L. Ball House in Minatrista. The rest of the world just didn't know it yet, but they were about to find out. And half of painting is just being confident. Just believe in yourself. Believe that you can do it. Because you can. You really can. You can do anything. Now there was only one thing left to do. Prove to Jim and the crew that he was as cool a cat in front of the camera as he was in front of the canvas. Watch this, watch this. So many things I want to show you, I get carried away here. When he started, it was live to tape from the top to the bottom and there was no script for us to have except the clock. Our script was the clock. And we would count him down, and he was just superb at seeing that. The only thing that really troubled us, and I heard it in the control room when I was in there a number of times, where they would say, oh my God, Bob is going to do another tree. There's one tree there, one tree there. And you can put as many or as few as you want. Here's a big son of a gun, big old tree. And they had a minute to go or something, and it, so he'll, he'll make it, he'll make it, just give him the countdown. And he'd get down there to 10 seconds, he said, I think we'll call it done. God bless you and happy painting. I think we about got a finished one here. Let's take a little red, sign this one, and we'll call it done. Hope you've enjoyed it. I'd love to see some photographs of your work. If you have time, send me a couple. Let me see what you're doing. He was a master at that. Never had a script, a written script at all. It was all in his head. Yep, some of us got it and some of us don't. That stroke of genius, it's all in our heads. Just like the joy of painting, the Joy of Bob Ross podcast isn't scripted. Yep, none of what I've been saying was written down. It's all coming out of my brain right now. Hold on a second. It wasn't long after Jim put Bob in front of the cameras that the joy of painting took off. Sorry, I just dropped my, uh, my Walkman. It wasn't long after Jim put Bob in front of the cameras that the joy of painting took off. And so heretofore with it did its magnetic, fuzzy-haired host. Right out of my brain. He really was energized by, by people watching him and interacting with him. And it didn't, not only didn't intimidate him, he was in his element. We've had so many people write and say, I want to see him again. Jim wasn't surprised by Bob's success on public television. It was what was happening outside the studio that raised eyebrows. I remember going to a, a parade where he was the Grand Marshal in Gas City, Indiana. 
And I thought, what will we do here? Well, we watched him, but I watched the parade from the sidelines. And the people, when he came along, they shouted and screamed at him. It was, it was fun to watch. And Bob just ate that up. He loved being the center of attention. And he loved talking to people. And when he talked to them, it wasn't because he was the center of attention. He would ask questions, and then he would listen. And they would talk to him. But look at some of these things that people are doing. And these come from all over the country. They're doing just marvelous things, things that I've never dreamed of doing. And they're beautiful. And I'm so proud of people who are doing this. And when he came to me about MTV and I told him, don't do that, the next thing I knew, he was on MTV and didn't, didn't pay attention to me. Look at there. Mm. There. MTV, the land of happy little trees. He didn't always take my advice. He didn't always take anyone's advice. He did what he thought was the best thing for him and for his product and for his program. He was always trying to do something that would interest his audience and not outpace them. So he never tried to do things that were too difficult for them. It's a rare opportunity to talk to someone who knew Bob so well, who worked alongside him for years. Robert Norman Ross was a notorious prankster. Did the boss ever become a victim of Bob's tomfoolery? He put one of his uh, pet squirrels, uh, Peapod the Pocket Squirrel, on my shoulder, and that annoyed me, but everybody else was laughing because I was I was trying to, to shrug him off, and you can't shrug off a little squirrel when it's climbing up your your leg or your arm or going down it, and those needle-like claws that the, the little tiny squirrels have just go right through your clothing. And I usually wore dress clothing, and it went right through that. He wore jeans, and that it didn't go through his stuff. If you've been with us during this series, I've showed you two or three times our little squirrel that we call Peapod the Pocket Squirrel, and he's one of the most precious little creatures. But he was laughing, and, and he just put it on my shoulder. He didn't ask. He just pulled it out and said, oh, here's Peapod, here. And put it on my shoulder. Who Peapod went across my back and down my arm and then down my leg. And I said, this is really hurting. This hurt. These are sharp. He's laughing. He, says, he said, you'll get used to it. It's not hurting him. I said, you're right. It's not hurting him. It's me. <laughs> so he, he said, come on up here. And it actually responded to him, which is amazing. And hopefully he'll stay around my backyard when I turn him loose and, and still visit with me. But if he doesn't, I know he's happy, and he's doing what squirrels should do. Then there was the time Jim came down to Florida to visit Bob, to see how he prepared his paintings for the TV show. And he said, why don't we take a swim? We've been working at this for several hours. And I said, that sounds great. Is your pool heated? And of course, he said, yes. And I said, you or me? He said, go ahead, jump in. You'll like it. It's really warm. I know where this is going. 40 degrees. 40 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> I start screaming. I said, Bob, I haven't seen you in the pool. And I've never seen your hair wet, but it's going to be wet right now. You can either jump in or I'm going to throw you in. <laughs> he laughed and he jumped in. He's, woo, it's cold in here. Yeah, so I know that. I get carried away sometimes. The tighter we get with the folks we love, the more it hurts when they're gone. Jim Needham's a religious man, raised Christian, the son of missionaries. He leads a Bible study class. I ask him how he feels about having lost his friend and colleague. I remember him well, and I treasure the fact that, that he's a part of my life. He was and still is. And it's an irony to me that Bob, who was so dynamic and energetic at 52, will always be 52 in the minds and hearts of most people. And it's not just podcast hosts who ask Jim about his relationship with Bob. It's lots of folks. They don't ask questions about me, they ask questions about Bob. And it's fun to talk about it. And they love hearing about him. And so in that sense, he's still alive in my life, and my heart. I talk about him and I tell the truth about what I knew about him and, and what I liked about him and what he was like to work with. Jim's faith in Bob extends beyond the man himself. It stretches to all those who practice Bob's technique, the folks who teach others to do the same. I pray for the CRIs, actually, that they will have the opportunity to connect. And I know they will because the message he was giving them was that you can succeed if you try. And there really are no mistakes, only happy accidents. But then as you begin painting, all these little things that were happy accidents turn into beautiful little things. Don't fight them. Learn to enjoy them. Let them happen. And that was his way of 
dealing with things. So yesterday, one of his trained instructors was working with the children at the children's workshop. The wind blew over the painting he was working on on its face so that it hit the table. And the little boy's face just went bereft. I was standing there taking pictures, still pictures. And Chris saw what had happened. So, oh, wow, that's a happy accident. Come on, look at what we can make with this now. Now we're going to move it. And he just, he turned it over, set it back on the easel, started doing it. And the little boy's went, face went from just terror to a big smile, <laughs> which is exactly what Bob would have done. And, you know, I, I know that. I saw him work with people, and he was incredible. Shoot. It's unreal what you can do. Absolutely unreal. Let me get my liner brush here. All the cherished memories Jim has of Bob Ross comes with only one regret. He asked me four or five times to take a class with him, and I told him I didn't have time. I'm not a great painter, but I, I did paint with Bob once early on in his career when he was doing his first auction. It was a fascinating experience because when I, when I was called to paint, I told him I couldn't paint, and he looked right into the camera and said, everybody paints, you know that. Everybody, everybody paints differently. That's what makes it wonderful. And the 200 people, and there were shifts of about 200 volunteers that went there, they all laughed at me. <laughs> but that was all right. It was live television. Bob was our superstar, and there was nothing I could do about it. And then I came back, and the, and the mountains I'd put in the center of the painting were gone. And I said, what happened to my mountains? And he leaned back, and he showed me that behind his shoulder, they'd, he'd moved to me. So they liked it better over here. Lift it up, because this is our world. We control it. When I go home, the only, the only power I have is over the garbage. It sits there and waits for me to come home and take it out. But here, I can literally move mountains. And I did too, and I realized he'd fix anything I'd do wrong. So, and I didn't do it wrong, I just, I did it where he didn't want them. He wanted them in the center of the painting to show people how to do it and show them that he could show me how to make mountains, and he did, and they were pretty good mountains. It seems to be working pretty good, so we'll just keep on going with it. But he moved them because he didn't want them there in the final painting. So he did a lot of adjusting before that person came 1130 at night and picked up the painting. And she was just transformed by the opportunity to meet Bob, started crying as soon as, as he walked down the steps to see her. And Bob trotted down there and, and gave her a hug and said, are you all right? Looking her in the face, close to, his face close to her. And she said, yes, I'm all right. I'm just so thrilled to see you and to be able to win your painting. And you're the best part of my day. Every day I'm an invalid, I sit on my couch and watch you, and it's just the best part of my life, Bob. Thank you so much for what you do. You're the best part of my day, Bob. That's the sort of sentiment we reserve for the special people in our lives. Our significant others, beloved family members, maybe even our pet squirrels. But TV painters? You're the best part of my life? And I was just amazed by that and said to Bob, you ever heard that before? That's incredible. That's just incredible. And he says, I hear it all the time. Because what I'm doing changes people. And it did. It does. It still does. He's still changing people. Painting can change your life. It can change everybody's life. I get letters every day from people who have discovered that have discovered the show. Maybe maybe they were maybe they were sick for a few days or they were injured and they happened to be laying at home and flipping the channels and they come upon the show and they sort of sort of get captivated by it and they continue to watch it and it has literally changed hundreds and hundreds thousands of people's lives and to know that is to feel like it's been a great investment of my time my energy my life to be part of this thing and support it jim needham hasn't just invested his time and energy into bob he's dedicated the greater part of his life to teaching too he taught Sunday school at his church for more than 25 years. There's a part of the Bible where, where the Apostle Paul talks about whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. It's in Philippians chapter 4. But it, it says, do these things and the peace of God will be with you. And that he models that for people. And he models it with his mantra about no mistakes, only happy accidents. And all of the instructors learn to do that because that's the way you encourage people and when you encourage people, whether you're a, a manager or you're a painter or a teacher, it changes the way they think. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, 
If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I spent half my life in the military. And I would play soldier all day, then at night I would come home. And this painting was a way of finding a world that was full of peace and it was calm and there was no bad things here. And as B.F. Skinner said in his book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, first you make your habits and then your habits make you. And if those habits are to see the good in people and see the good in things, then you see them and you do it as a matter of habit. It's like anything else. The more you practice, the easier it becomes. What's hard today will be simple tomorrow and the next day it will just be a habit. You won't even have to think about it. In 1992, after 17 years in charge, Jim Needham stepped away from WIPB. He remains an ambassador for the station, the university, and for Bob and the Bob Ross Company. It's just been a, a, a great privilege to be connected to him in the way I am, and I'm happy about that. Thank you very much for allowing me into your home. I've made literally hundreds and hundreds of fantastic friends and I enjoy your company, and I hope you enjoy mine, and hope you continue to watch. Let me hear from you. You're very special people. Very, very special. After WIPB, Jim took teaching a step further. He taught at Ball State University for nearly two more decades, serving as the communication department's chief academic advisor for over a thousand students. He and his wife, Linda, have been married for more than 45 years. The couple established a scholarship at Ball State to do exactly what Bob did on the joy of painting. Encourage student achievement. You'll be surprised at what you can do. You'll be absolutely amazed at the effects you can achieve. And you can do it. You can do anything, anything that you believe you can do. Anything that you believe you can do. You can do. Before he retired as Professor Emeritus, a distinguished honor reserved for the best of the best college professors. Jim had an opportunity to teach in Korea. And they said, you've just got a master's degree. That's all you have, You'd, and, and 27 years experience, but you, you don't have a PhD, and only PhDs teach our students. Do you have an expanded resume? And so I sent them a nine-page deal with all my programs I'd ever done, and, and of course Bob Ross was in that. And instead of emailing me, he called, the chair of the department called me and said, oh, Mr. Needham, uh, I didn't realize you'd help create the joy of painting. Of course you can teach our students. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, that was Bob. my That was my PhD. <laughs> Years after Jim Needham opened the door for Bob Ross, Bob was somehow opening doors for Jim. We all need encouragement, faith in what we can do. It never hurts to have someone or something to help us cross the threshold. Bob did that for thousands of happy painters. He's still doing it. And Jim did it for Bob. He believed in him, he gave him a chance, and a platform to be the icon we all know and love today. One of the things my students would, would say to me sometimes in their disgust is they'd say, Mr. Needham, you're the master of the obvious. Well, yeah, but you know, all the coaches that coach from fundamentals are too. They say, this is what we're doing. This is what it takes. If you're not ready, get in the weight room and get ready. It's the same thing over and over and over. How many, how many weeks is that important? Every week. It's the fundamental. We're all alive human beings, and the only constant is change, really, except for Bob. Everything changes. Bob Ross stays the same. Inspiring, encouraging, lifting us up. He's in our hearts, in our minds, on our screens. It might have all gone differently if Bob and Annette had never showed up on the front porch of that little house in Muncie, Indiana, asking Jim Needham important questions. The most vital one being, you want to do a happy little painting show? Jim Needham truly was the man who made it happen. And that makes all this worthwhile. Just the fact that it works for people. Because it opens new worlds, new doors, things that you never believed you could do. You can. Look at that mountain that you made. <laughs> and it's so easy. The old clock on the wall tells me we've got another finished podcast episode. Bob, you're the clock master. What do you think? I think this one's ready for a signature. Right on. Hand me that brush, would you? I want to thank my guest, Jim Needham, 
and the fine folks at WIPB-TV in Muncie, Indiana. Big thanks to James Shapiro at Janssen Media, Mike Evans, and Stephanie Sylvester for helping us make another almighty episode. Support WIPB or your local public television station. Say thanks for giving us Bob Ross and the joy of painting. Don't just show support, show us your paintings. Use hashtag paint like Bob Ross. Bob Ross certified instructors, they're the only ones that know how to teach you Bob's world famous painting method. Don't settle for second best. You can find the local CRI at bobross.com and then click take a class. Got your own Bob Ross story to tell? Pick up that phone and leave us a message at 866-FANBRUSH or email us at podcast at bobross.com. And we've started spreading joy on a new interactive Facebook page. You can check out behind the scenes podcast photos, video clips, you can test your knowledge of Bob Ross trivia and interact with your fellow Bob superfans. Search us on Facebook at the Joy of Bob Ross Happy Little Podcast. I'm Ron Scalzo. The Joy of Bob Ross is produced by Lonely Weekend Productions in partnership with Bob Ross, Inc. Bob Ross name and images are registered trademarks of Bob Ross, Inc.